Uh, this is rebuilding the ship as it sails, making large legacy sites responsive. If that wasn't the talk you were here for, feel free to leave. I won't feel bad. Feel free to leave any time. I won't feel bad, I promise. My name is Philip James. I'm a senior software engineer at Eventbrite. Um, at, down at the bottom is my Twitter handle, and there's a hashtag. If you use the hashtag for talking about this talk, I can promise you at the very least I will favorite your tweet. If it's a really good tweet, it might get a retweet. If it's not, don't feel bad. Um, and we're talking about, today we're talking about making large legacy sites responsive. So let's be specific about the challenge that we were trying to solve at Eventbrite. In the summer of 2014, our engineering team was presented with a challenge. At the time, our site was mostly not responsive. We had a couple of flows that you could consider adaptive, by which I mean we were testing your user agent to see if you should get a separate mobile experience, but we didn't have responsive pages in the way that we come to think of them. Uh, and we knew, as many of you probably know, that the world is going more and more mobile. There's a chart I'm going to show. I love this chart. This is from uh, Mary Meeker's Internet Trends that she publishes every year at Kleiner Perkins Caulfield Buyer. Uh, what I love about this chart is it shows something that I think we sometimes forget when we're talking about making sites responsive, and that is mobile traffic is additive. It is not subtractive. We are just spending more time online, but your desktop experience is just as important as your mobile experience. So you have to figure out designs and strategies that make both mobile and desktop look good on your platform because your users are coming from both locations. Of course, your mileage may vary. You may find that all of your traffic is coming from mobile. That's great. But having a desktop experience and a good mobile experience is, of course, going to help you. So Eventbrite is a large legacy code base. We have hundreds of thousands of lines of both back-end and front-end software. We were officially founded in around 2006. We really started picking up steam in 2007. And we've been adding pages and features ever since. And so getting from this large legacy code base where we've gone through multiple iterations of what kind of JavaScript we're writing, multiple iterations of how we build front-end code, and saying we want to take that responsive was quite a challenge. Additionally, we were given a timeline. We had to make the site as responsive as possible in a month. Yes, this is possible. We know because we did it. Um, and we're going to talk a bit about how we did it. So just kind of give an outline. We had a month over last summer. We got most of our work done in a month. There's going to be a chart at the end that isn't that helpful, but it'll kind of give you a sense of how we improved ourselves. Um, and the way that we did it is what this talk is about. Some highlights are we did good prep work. We got every engineer involved, so front-end and back-end engineers helped with this project. And we put plans and testing in place to make sure that we had no downtime as we were going forward. So we were doing multiple releases a week, roughly 50 to 70 engineers working on the site all at the same time. And we got this thing done in a month. It is possible. Uh, so step one. Make it easy not to write code. Uh, the first way to make it easy not to write code is to have a style guide. A lot of this is hopefully going to sound pretty obvious. If it doesn't sound obvious, great, then I'm teaching you something new. But hopefully everyone in the room knows that you need to have a style guide. And in a good world, in a world that we want to live in, it should be a style guide that is like customized and optimized for your use case. You have an internal style guide that might be based on something like bootstrap or foundation, but yet that you've tweaked to make it yours and to make it very easy for front-end and back-end engineers to go in and make beautiful pages that meet your standards as quickly as possible. Um, this is just kind of a screenshot of our style guide. It's not a complete set of our style guide. This is just to give you an example of like when we're demoing our style guide, these are the kind of things that we include. So it's got like our headers, common menu bars, alert bars, modals, tabs. The things that we think we're going to be using over and over again in our site, it captures. But for this project, for the project of making our entire site as responsive as possible, the most important thing that we had established early in developing the style guide was a grid system. We've developed our own in-house grid system that's a responsive grid. And by working with our designers to develop this system, what it meant was by the time we reached this project, we didn't have to do a lot of back and forth passes with design. The grid already did what they wanted to do at the different breakpoints. And mostly what we were doing is tweaking, not major overhauls. 
Um, so have a, please have a style guide. Have it, make sure everybody knows about it, use it, make sure everybody is contributing back to it. Uh, so we knew this was coming down the pipe, and we knew that if we wanted back-end developers or even front-end developers that weren't that comfortable with JavaScript to be tweaking JavaScript code, we need a way to do rich components that could respond well to different screen sizes easily. And so we built a tool called Dorsal that's a complement to our style guide. Um, what it does, and I put the link up there, this is the one, I promise, the one plug in this talk for a tool that we've built that we think is cool and we would like more people to be using. Uh, if you're, we are mostly a backbone shop when it comes to a framework, uh, but there are things from other frameworks that we like, and one of them is kind of angular style rich components where we can take code that's like at the top and get a component that's like at the bottom uh, just by decorating HTML. We have some JavaScript that runs on the page and kind of goes, oh, you're using um, JSD date picker, which is how we tell Dorsal, hey, this is a date picker, and it replaces it with the rich component. Um, and so this combined with the style guide made it so that we could move, have people moving really quickly. There wasn't, nobody had to know, now we no longer needed to write JavaScript to get fancy components that responded better. They could just drop this in the HTML and we could write it once. Um, of course, that didn't work perfectly, but it worked, I think, a lot better than we were expecting. Uh, let me see if there's anything in. Cool, uh, it is open source. You're welcome to contribute to it. It's open on GitHub, we think it's cool. So that was kind of the begin the pre-planning from the tools perspective, step two was really getting everyone involved. And I do mean everyone. Um, and part one of getting everyone involved is having a map. A thing that we learned as part of this project is that we didn't have a great internal site map of all the pages that make Eventbrite. And so while we were building these tools and doing this planning, that was one of the things we did is made a massive site map, posted it to the wall, and then grouped it into teams that made sense and let each of the engineers, and remember this is the full set of front-end and back-end engineers who are working on this project, choose the areas of the site they wanted to work on. And I think, and a lot of us think, that this was actually one of the things that really helped drive this project to completion, is people got to work on what they wanted to work on and got to work on what was interesting to them, so they were more motivated to work on it for that stretch. If you think of this month-long project as a very long sprint, you want people to be motivated for that sprint as much as possible, and they may be motivated in their day-to-day, -day, they may be motivated for their normal teams, but the work you do on your day-to-day -day team is a marathon. You know you're gonna be there for most of the year, and so you might be more cautious, you know you're gonna have to do more with this code later, you're thinking more about the future. When you're trying to get something done in a sprint setting, you probably wanna change it up so that you can just like, go. Um, so here's the question. Hopefully some of you had this question, we had this question. If we're gonna get everybody involved, including back-end engineers, what are we gonna do with all these back-end engineers? Some of whom who have never touched front-end code. Some of whom have only written a bit of HTML to make their front-end code work. Uh, and the kind of big next lesson that we learned and the thing that I think really helped us drive this project forward was training. At the very first day of the project, we got everyone who wasn't traditionally a front-end engineer into a room, pair programming on a simple project where at the end of that day, they had turned a non-responsive page into a responsive page using our style guide and using our framework. Um, I, this is another thing where we can't overemphasize how important this was because you need to get your people knowing the tools that they have at their disposal as fast as possible and getting used to the idea of pair programming. Um, there is a controversial statement that I'm going to make here that if you're about to embark on one of these projects and you're a front-end engineer or just an engineer who deals with front-end technologies, this is a node conference. Not everybody is probably a front-end engineer, but probably everybody here programs a little bit of JavaScript. That's front-end engineer-ish. Um, your time on one of these projects is probably better spent being a source of knowledge and a pair programming partner and a debugging partner than actually making pages responsive yourself. 
you are, a, whether you realize it or not, you are probably a bottleneck towards other people getting their work done. And so you should try to be helping maybe more than you're being an individual contributor when you're going after one of these massive projects. And so that's why when we set this up, we had the kind of the tooling phase at the beginning where the front end engineers were making a big charge and a big push on getting the tools ready. And then we did do individual contributor work during the project, but a lot of our time was spent helping and training and making sure that everyone was moving as fast as possible. Uh, cool, so training was really important. I recommend it. Now we get to the real meat of it. We've got our framework, we've got our style guide, we've got the tools that'll help us, we've trained everyone on how to use it. How do we actually get things moving? Um, probably the most important thing that you can do is test on actual devices. Remember, we're going from a site that is mostly not responsive to mostly responsive. And the Chrome simulator is great, the Firefox simulator is great, but there's always going to be bugs and discrepancies that you're not going to find until you're on an actual device. There can even be discrepancies between the simulator on your Mac and an actual device. And additionally, I don't know if anybody has tried this, it's really hard to simulate an Android device on a Mac. It's just like way more tooling and setup than it probably should be. So work with your mobile team or have people contribute to their devices, set up proxies so that you can test locally, test against your dev servers, and make sure that everything looks passable and usable before it goes. Um, and this also ties into working with QA as early as possible and working with design as early as possible so that there's a very easy pipeline between a developer thinks their work is done, they get it checked off by a design person, which isn't in depth, it's more of a, hey, take a look at this, make sure you're not like raging that it looks awful, um, make sure that it goes past a QA person's eyes once and then ship it. Because this is mostly front-end work and because there weren't necessarily huge feature changes, we were trying to move as fast as possible. We also knew we had this deadline of, in a month, we either need to restructure or move on to a different project, so this was the deadline. And if we weren't doing fast releases, if we weren't doing lots of testing, it would have slowed us down to the point where we probably wouldn't have gotten done as much as we got done. Um, part of releasing as fast as possible is you want feedback from the rest of the organization and from your customers. We had a policy where pretty much every day our changes were released to the staging server, which was kind of like the last step before production in our release workflow. And that meant that we were shipping out our changes to people like our support, to sales, to the rest of the company. They knew we were making this big push and so they could start testing and seeing, hey, is there anything that I think is critical to my flow or that I know customers care about that is broken because of these changes? And so in many ways it became a whole company effort. They all knew we were doing this. They knew that we were basically focused on this for the month that we were working on it and they provided the support that we needed to get it done. Uh, and another thing that I can't stress enough, this kind of ties into the letting people choose their own teams, is celebrating. And I'm not just talking about like celebrating at the end, which of course you should do when you should throw a big party and like take people out for beer or whatever works for your company, but you should be celebrating the small victories as well. At the end of every week, we would have a demo party and we would also celebrate amazing individual accomplishments and we would let people nominate each other for individual accomplishments. And this may seem kind of like pointless ego boosting, but I guarantee you it is not. It brings the entire team together, it let everybody see what everybody else is working on, and it's something that we have tried to continue replicating in the rest of our day-to-day -day flow after this project because it produces such amazing results of getting everybody together and caring about what everyone else is working on. Okay, so now you probably want to actually hear about the results. Um, we hit our goals, hooray! I, if we hadn't, I probably wouldn't be giving a talk because that'd be Probably not a great talk. Um, more importantly than hitting our goals, and we'll get into this in a couple slides, is we changed our culture. We, because we spent an entire month taking pages that weren't responsive and making them responsive, we started thinking mobile first, and we started thinking in terms of what this was going to look like on other devices, and it was a change that went top to bottom. Our designers started designing mobile first, we started programming mobile first, we would start with the mobile version and then kind of grow it out with more features for the bigger versions. Um, and since then, I don't think there has been a single page on our site that has not been designed responsive and mobile first. So that is probably a bigger accomplishment than what we accomplished in that month of working. But to give you some hard numbers, um, that's a lot of code we changed. Yes, it was 50 engineers working for a month. That's still a lot of code. So 113 pages done, I think, is 
I think is the most impressive statistic, but 1327 code commits and no downtime, that many files changed, I think that's pretty great. Uh, totally possible. Here is my uh, crappy graph that I drew on a whiteboard because I'm not very good at graphing software about what we accomplished in that time. We went from about 2% of our site responsive, maybe not including some of the adaptive flows where if we found you had the right user agent, we would send you to a different page kind of thing, to about 70% responsive in that month. And then after that month, there was kind of a, like a, a focus team that took some of the really thorny problems and continued on them. So that number is probably higher by the end of that summer. But the important thing I think that I tried to capture here and probably didn't do well is the rate of change from us going non-responsive to responsive or the rate of change of pages on our site being responsive dramatically increased as a result of this project because everybody was now thinking mobile first and knew the tools to make responsive sites. Uh, so, Takeaways, you can do this. It is totally possible. You may have a bigger site than Eventbrite, you may have a smaller site than Eventbrite. You can make one of these big responsive changes. Um, building tools to help helps and train everyone and get everyone involved. It will make your organization better and stronger in the future. And with that, I am going to open it up to questions. Yeah, uh, I will try to repeat them, but if you feel like coming to the mic, the people who run AV would really appreciate it. But you can also just yell it at me and then I'll repeat it. Okay. Uh, you had, uh, I took away that you did a tool, you did a style guide, and then you actually did the conversion. You talked about how much overlap was there in those tasks? Did you get the, the style guide done first and then the tool, or were they really a lot of overlap even today? That's a great question. So I'll repeat the question. Um, how much overlap was there between the time where we were doing tooling and the time where we were actually converting pages? So the great thing about our style guide is, is, is it is a living style guide. So every time we find something we think should go in it, we do add it back. Um, but for this project, we tried to capture as much of the tooling as possible before the conversion kicked off. Um, and I think trying to do both at the same time would have been really difficult. The kind of senior engineer, the senior front end engineering leadership had maybe a week, maybe two weeks notice that this project was coming down the pipe. Maybe it was a month, I might be misremembering. Um, and so we spent that time before the project kicked off building a bunch of this tooling and writing a bunch of documentation and building the tutorial to get the plan in place so that when the project did kick off, everyone could hit the ground running. Does that answer your question? Great. Cool. Hi. Um, so I think the developer metrics are important, but what about user metrics? What? decrease in file size or increase, what kind of conversion rates, anything cool. like that set up? Um, we do have those numbers. For reasons, those numbers are trickier to share. Um, I can give you ballpark numbers. And the ballpark numbers I can give you is that kind of surprise, like we were surprised at the amount that our mobile traffic went up after this conversion. Because we didn't, we didn't publicize it a whole bunch. It's just kind of like users came to the site one day and noticed this page they had been using for months suddenly responded to their device better. But we saw a greater uptick of mobile traffic as a result of doing this that was greater than the pattern of mobile traffic than we were seeing. And that translated into orders as well. Um, we saw more orders coming from mobile and more things being done on the site through mobile and tablet just because this was available to them. And so what that told us was, Either there was this word of mouth effect going on that we didn't know about, or our users had been wanting this for a really long time. And we had a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence to show that our users did want this for a very long time. But our users wanted this for, there's, there was data now to show that our users really did want this and they would use our site more if we had this conversion. Additionally, we know that Google has some of its ranking algorithms around how heavy your site is, how which is related to how long it takes to load, whether it's served over HTTPS, and also whether it's mobile optimized, they will give preference, especially if you're searching on a mobile device, to a site that is mobile optimized. And so that could also be a follow-on effect of Google driving more traffic to our site. But the actual like hard and fast numbers can't really share those, sorry. Yeah, question in the back. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Um, we changed a lot. How did we deploy it and was it progressive over time? I'm not sure how to answer that last part. Uh, 
we, the way we deploy at Eventbrite is we do re like full releases twice a week and we do kind of internal releases hourly, you might say, um, where it's like public versus private servers when I'm talking about like internal versus external releases. And so by the time, uh, so another thing that really helped with this is we have part of our CI flow is that you push to a branch, our CI server picks up that branch, runs tests against that branch, and then merges to master. And if you, if you are merging to master directly, that is basically considered an error in our CI flow. Um, and that meant that we were at least passing a basic set of tests for every commit that landed onto master. And from that, we were able to have the confidence to do pretty much hourly internal releases. And so we could start testing on a production-like environment as soon as possible. Did that kind of answer your question? So, so it sounds like you would, you would change a page and that would be deployed that day or that week? Yeah, exactly. So, so the turnaround time from a page being like finished, converted, to it being live for a customer could be as little as 24 hours, could be as long as a couple of days if it's like the weekend because we're not going to release on the weekend. Our ops team would kill us. Um, I probably have time. I mean, I'm a little over. I'm going to take one more question because nobody's yelling at me yet. Yeah, you have a Question? Yeah, um, you were saying that you have this uh, in your specs model with your CI. How are you using spec against the response to this? What tooling would you use to test the front end of this? What do you think the actual pretty of it is? Yeah, um, that's a great question. A lot of our front end test, so there's a two part answer to that. For some of our like JavaScript specific testing, which isn't um, necessarily testing prettiness or responsiveness, but it's testing workness, um, we use Jasmine in a test runner um, for like kind of full on prettiness user ex browser experience. We use Selenium through Sauce, and we had some tests around that for making sure that things were working and available at different sizes. Selenium with Sauce Labs. Selenium with Sauce Labs, yeah is our flow. Um, I'm going to show one more thing, and I'm happy, totally happy to take questions afterwards. Feel free to come up and chat with me. I'm happy to talk more about the subject. Um, I'm just going to throw out, I'm running this thing for the month of December called Homage for the Holidays. If you build something and blog about it, you'll get a piece of digital art. Here's some stuff here. I think it's cool. If you were at my uh, bot, Twitter bot talk yesterday and you make a Twitter bot and you blog about it, I'll retweet it and you'll get a piece of digital art that I had commissioned for this. So yeah, that's kind of neat. Um, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.